Welcome to another episode of The Watchdog. This is Low Key. We are here on Mint Press. As you know, weekly we are going against the grain and covering the stories which are regularly ignored by the mainstream media. For that reason, we hope that you can support us by clicking like, sharing and subscribing on this channel. But also, we hope that you can support us on Patreon in any way you can. Now, we have a really special episode this week. I'm joined by three of my favorite people in the world, actually, in terms of their work and their output. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to them for being here for this episode. We have on the far left, Matt Kennard, investigative journalist, formerly of the Financial Times and currently of Declassified UK. We have to his right, Huda Amori, the one of the founders of Palestine Action, which is leading an unprecedented um, insurgency against Israel's military interests in this country with significant successes, which we will be speaking about later in the show. And also we have from Electronic Intifada, Asa Wynn Stanley, who has haunted the Labour Party <laughs> and Asaf Kaplan of Unit 8200. He's broken some really significant stories over time. So it'd be great to catch up with him and talk to him about his new book, so to start with, I'd like to talk to you, Matt. Um, you've recently published a really important story about something called the British American Project. Could you tell us about that, please? Yeah, definitely. So um, the British American Project is not very well known about, but it kind of is a window into so many um, things about how British politics works and the different influences that, that are here. Um, it was basically started in the early 80s um, because there was concern about Michael Foote's Labour Party, effectively a unilateral disarmament, um, the, the, he was pro-phasing out NATO. I mean, there's a lot of similarities actually with him and Corbyn and what happened. But this guy, the, the, this guy called Nick Butler, who went on to be a senior official in BP, was at that time at Chatham House, which is the establishment um, think tank, was funded by the State Department and... NATO and all the, all the uh, usual crowd. Um, he wrote to the director of Chatham House saying, look, <clears throat> we've, got to, um, we've got to do something about Anglo-American relations, especially on the left, because uh, the left is moving away from the, um, this tight sort of support and un, uh, unthinking support, which effectively was kind of consensus for a long time. Michael Foote was a breach. So the story was quite interesting. So I got some of the history that hadn't been come out, that hadn't come out. So they got, a, they got funded by the US Embassy. They got a thousand pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot. I think it was more in the eighties, but they got a thousand pounds to go and do a fact finding mission to Washington. This is what they admit to. So there was probably other stuff going on. But anyway, at that time it was, the embassy was involved. Um, and then they created this institution, which, uh, is very, very shady. And I think um, once you strip away all the propaganda about it just being a, a, a social networking, transatlantic um, sort of uh, group, you see that it's actually about recruiting and cultivating the British left um, and making sure they do not stray into what is called anti-Americanism, but what, what is effectively anti-war, anti-NATO, um, anti-militarism. Um, and that's something that I wanted to get across in the article because what the CIA call anti-American is not what we would call anti-American, for example. And I'll just talk a bit about, about the CIA connection as well, because at this time, the CIA was massively concerned about what was happening with Foote's labor. And this came out, they the CIA declassified a load of files in 2017 when Corbyn was leader, which were covered in the press. So it was an interesting time to declassify those files. But it basically showed they were concerned about him and there was a specific reference to him in El Salvador. They were monitoring him in El Salvador. Um, and there was, other, there was another reference to him as well. Uh, this is the monitoring of who? Of, of Corbyn. Of Corbyn yeah. in El Salvador. Yeah. This is the CIA. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they explicitly said in this internal report that they declassified, the, the biggest threat to US interests would be a, a win for Michael Foote in the 1983 election. I mean, we know this happens, but it's quite good to see it there in black and white. And just so we can be clear, the declassified documents which show that the CIA was surveilling Jeremy Corbyn yeah. was from what year? 1986. And it, I, they weren't directly <clears throat> surveilling. They were, they, he was traveling to El Salvador. This was the time of the Civil War. And he was a supporter of, the, uh, of, a, of a union 
called Fenestra, which was or, uh, <coughs> allied to the Marxist guerrillas while the US was supporting the military government. They probably were surveilling him, but it was more just an intelligence report about he, he's gone or he... Which what, featured what his doing. name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he also appeared in the WikiLeaks State Department cables, that's in the article too. There was a demonstration against the, the, the charge to war in Iraq in 2002 in Istanbul. Uh, which he spoke at and was apparently monitored by embassy staff because they 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 described what the chants were and they said something along the lines of like and it was also attended and the speakers included uh, British politician Jeremy Corbyn. So Corbyn and Foot were kind of like were complete outliers in the Labour Party. I mean, we can talk a bit about this later, but the Labour Party is effectively set up to absorb and neutralize any kind of anti-war left uh, and anti-imperialist left. That's its role. So when you have something like Foot and Corbyn, it's a very serious uh, problem for the system because that's it's not running as it should. And the British American project has gone on, to, uh, has got more and more important, but become more and more kind of untouched. No one talks about it. If this, like, you're only allowed to talk about Russian interference in, in the UK, a lot of which is completely made up propaganda by the media. There's only, uh, on the British American Project side, John Pilger wrote quite a lot about it in the 90s. And then there was one article in The Guardian in 2004, which was actually not bad when the, before The Guardian became complete rubbish. Apart from that, there's nothing. And this is thousands, we're talking thousands now, or 1,200, they say. But we're talking the top journalists, loads of people from BBC, from Jeremy Paxman, Jane Hill, um, Isabel Hilton, all these figures from the world of the UK military as well. In fact, yeah. the military is a quite interesting one because General, um, General Lord Richard Dannon, who was head of the UK army from 2006 to 2009, he joined in 1986, the year after it was founded. Um, and the story was based around these documents I got, which showed uh, who they were adding this year. And they don't release their members or their funders. So it was, it was, uh, that was interesting. And they added two UK um, military officers and then subsequent, a question was asked in Parliament um, about to the Ministry of Defence, do you know, do you have any relations with the British American Project? Do you know? And they said, we don't, we don't we're not aware of any of our personnel uh, ever having a fellowship, which is crazy. Yeah. So either they're lying or everyone who's ever had a fellowship uh, in the UK military has just not told the Ministry of Defence, which I, I don't think is very uh, plausible. But anyway, so it's, it's a massive community and it's very, very... Uh, sophisticated form of uh, cultivation because a lot of the people I think don't aren't aware that they're they're into it that, that what they're getting into like and I'll, I'll just finish with this is that we for the piece I interviewed Emma Dent Code the um, former uh, Labour MP for Kensington and she was approached in the 1980s by a senior official at CND. Can you make clear what CND stands for? CND is the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament which was founded, uh, one of the founders of it was Michael Foote and was actually a major target of the CIA and the US government in the 80s because um, it, it, it argued for unilateral disarmament, um, which was uh, obviously also a popular cause across different countries in Europe. And there was a Europe-wide propaganda campaign which was started by the US to destroy unilateralist organizations. But anyway, that was a CND. So she was in, involved in CND, her friend, who was a senior official in CND, was a member of BAP and tried to recruit her to the British American Project. And she was like, she said that the way they did it was just very, very, she used the word smelly. And it, it, it does sound like, like you, they basically just said, just come to Washington. You, you become part of this group. You, we'll pay for you to come every year. You just meet lots of nice people and have nice dinners. And, and Emma was saying, well, I knew something was up. But interestingly, she found out subsequently, because she was good friends with this recruiter's husband, that this woman uh, was working for the CIA. That's what he told her. I mean, um, and this isn't conspiracies. This is a, Emma Denko is a serious person. Um, she's the head of the Labour group on Kensington Council now. Uh, and she said that she then looked up this, this person and saw that they'd moved on from CND to Saatchi and Saatchi. So she, she was like, well, it does kind of make sense then. If you, that does, that's not a usual progression that you move from the CND to a, a right-wing PR company. So she believed it. Um, and then ben, the other person who was uh, actually a really high-value target for an organisation like that is, was Benjamin Zephaniah, who's an advisor to Declassified as well. So I interviewed him about it. And he was, he was recruited at the Hay Literary Festival. So he gave a talk and someone came up to him and said, hey, man, do you want to come and join this really cool group, which is helping young people get together in America and Britain, which thought, well, that sounds all right. 
he said he went to a few of the events, business class to Berkeley in California and another place. And he just, he said it was, he, he, the word he used was he realized he'd been duped. Like it was just full of uh, uh, met corporates in suits. Um, and it was not what it said on the tin. Um, and he, he just ignored it. But I think that he was kind of an outlier. I think most people get quite into the whole community. Um, the other interesting thing is that the two founders of Byline Times, Peter Jukes and Stephen Colgrave, met as British American uh, Project Fellows in 1999. Uh, I interviewed Jukes for the piece as well, and he said that he's moved away from the group because he said it's been penetrated by Trumpists. Just one question on the kind of corporate aspect of it. Mm. Um, could you tell us a bit more about its funding? Because it's yeah. certainly a lot deeper than a thousand pounds from the US Embassy, yeah. right? Tell us a bit more. Well, they don't now divulge <clears throat> their funders and they have on and off. So you can find out from archived web pages, but it's kind of like a, just a roll call of all the most evil corporations like Monsanto, um, BP, BAE Systems, Coca-Cola. It's, there's, obviously they have no sort of scruples about who funds them. Um, now we don't know, but an archived web pages also show that the US Embassy was funding them from 2007 to 2011. <laughs> that was the only thing I could, the only sort of web pages I could access, but you, it's very likely that was carrying over to the to the other years as well. And on that BP question, there's quite an interesting crossover because now you have the former head of MI6 in a yeah. significant position at both the British American Project yeah. and at BP. Can you tell us a well, bit about yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. So, so John Sawyers, who was um, head of MI6 from 2009 to 2014, um, sits on the... He joined British American Project in 1995. So you see how the recruitment works. He, I mean, he was just a, a, I don't know if he was in the foreign office at that point. And look at Danny. So if you look at Danny's trajectory exactly. as well. So, so John Sawyer joined in 1995. He went on to be very important in the Blair administration. He was a foreign policy advisor to um, Tony Blair at the time of the war in Iraq. And in May 2003, he was appointed by Blair, UK special representative to Iraq. In 2009, BP returned to Iraq after a 35-year absence. In 2015, when Sawyer steps down from, the year after Sawyer steps down from MI6, he becomes the director of um, BP. In the first four and a half years, he makes 699,000 pounds. I looked through the BP annual accounts. So that's kind of how the system works. I mean, I'm not saying it's a, a reward, but you can see how, how, how it works. But what's quite interesting is, he sits on the advisory uh, board of uh, British American Project alongside Ben Okri, who is a celebrated post-colonial poet. And this shows how it works. And I'm sure he's, he's a good guy with good politics. And in fact, I looked up some of the stuff he said about empire. And yes, he, he's, he says the right things. I'm sure he just doesn't, isn't aware of Soyuz's past and isn't aware of what the British American Project is. But that's why it's so clever. It, can, it cultivates people like Ben Okri. And Benjamin Zephaniah, who kind of saw that there was something up with it, but there's many others that um, uh, that didn't see that. And in fact, it's quite interesting if you look at what, what, who they target. It's often people from racial minorities, uh, people from diverse sexual backgrounds, all that kind of stuff. So it's very much about cultivating the left or people that would may stray into anti-Americanism or anti-war sentiment, and just bringing them in and kind of being like, "Come and have a nice dinner." Is Sir John Sawyer's. And using yeah. identity politics to do it. Exactly. Standard. And an interesting aspect of what we're saying is Yasmin Alibi Brown is yep. also, I think, still part of it or certainly was previously. Yep. And so what you have is a situation where any given night, whether it's Isabel Hilton or Jeremy Paxman or Yasmin Alibi Brown or Ben Okri, you will probably see someone from the British American Project on your TV screens. Yep. Daily, that yep. is the case. And that is this sort of hegemonic, um, push that they've been able to establish. Now, there's two things I want to just be clear about. What was the relationship between the Blair government and the British American Project? How many members of the British American Project did Tony Blair have in his cabinet? Well, in his first cabinet after he won in 97, he appointed five British American Project members to his cabinet that we know of. Right. Might be more. Because <clears throat> um, as I say, the membership roles are not public. We don't know. Um, and then he, I found a parliamentary question actually that he'd answered uh, soon after he got elected or a couple of years after where he was asked about the British American project. And he said, sort of um, uh, the usual, uh, this is it's a networking organization to in enhance the special relationship. But then he said, and they organize, arrange meetings for UK government ministers. And you're sort of like, what? Well, so he, they had access to his ministers, all of them. 
yeah. and were arranging meetings for them with young people from. So they were obviously very, very powerful within the Blair administration. Jonathan Powell, his chief of staff, was a, is still a BAT member, but was a BAT member all the way through uh, <laughs> his 10-year reign. Jonathan Powell now heads up Intermediate, which is a conflict mediation group, which he commented on uh, in a private email to one of Hillary Clinton's staffers, works closely, that's the quote, with MI6. So you can find it online. That was actually declassified by the US State Department. It probably caused him a bit of problems with that, but it's an establishment networking yeah. uh, uh, group. And one last question sure. on this topic, and we, we, we have the Labour Party connection. There's also the quite close involvement of someone, well, of a family member, of someone who was identified in the uh, U.S. Embassy cables or as a strictly protect informant of the U.S. Embassy within the Labour Party. So could you tell us about the connection between Ruth Smith and uh, the British American Project? Yeah, so Michael Smith, who is her husband, I think, I'm not sure if they're still married, but uh, definitely was her husband. He is a key Stella. figure. Yeah, he's UK chair of, I think, the executive board. And he's uh, he's one of three directors of the company, that like registered company. So he's a very important figure within it. Obviously, Ruth Me, again, this is quite interesting because as I say, the British American project hasn't been covered at all. But also the fact that Ruth Me, a, a Labour, who was, when that cable was published, was was on her way to becoming a Labour MP and it's never been talked about. I don't think, I don't think one newspaper's ever mentioned that she was a, a US informant. Whereas you can imagine if it came out that Chris Williamson was a Russian informant, uh, we might have heard a little bit about it in the media. Yeah, yeah so she took a so label was, on his account so everyone saw it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> there was a cable that was sent in 2009 um, uh, by Richard LeBaron, who was then uh, Deputy Chief of Mission at, at the US Embassy, where she is she she's talking to him and, he, and she's referred to as a strictly protected informant about what Gordon Brown's thinking is about uh, when he's going to call an election. And he, he even says in the cable, he says, this has not been reported in the press. She might be yeah. a member. She probably has been on the fellowship. But, yeah. um, but the, there's, it, the, the funny thing is that I, I, I approached the British American Project for comment, obviously, and they told me we have no formal relationship with the US Embassy, which is amazing <laughs> that they said that because you just, like most of it I got from Twitter, but there's just... Uh, tons of evidence of yeah. all these events happening at the, yeah. the US Embassy. Until last year, British American Project even had the US Embassy logo on their website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea that they don't have some formal relationship is, is yeah. preposterous, really, I think. I mean, an interesting thing on the Ruth Smith uh, side of things is that she was formerly the Director of Public Affairs at BICON, the biggest yeah. Israel lobby group in this country, and has also worked hand in hand with the GMB union to mm. push support mm. for the arms trade in Parliament. Yeah. Now, of course, it was the GMB union that lobbied the TUC with a dossier, which seems like it came from an organisation headed by people who are on the board of the JNF, the largest settlement building organisation in Palestine, um, to no platform me. So you have really interesting uh, crossovers here. Also, she's now CEO of Index on Censorship. She was appointed by Trevor Phillips, who is the chair of the board of Index, who has been a like, very prominent figure within the British American Project for like 20 years, probably, uh, and was close to Blair. Again, racial uh, minority, like it, per, kind of the perfect British American Project recruit. So yeah, I mean, it's all it's all murky. Obviously, Peter Mandelson as well yeah. was a, is a has been a. British Good friend of Jeremy, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And not not Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Corbyn. Um, but again, so this, I'll just finish with this, actually, because the article tries to draw out the links between the uh, foot period and the Corbyn period. So what yeah. you see is that a lot of the people that became critics of Corbyn, yeah. including Ruth Smee, but plenty of others, were in some way um, uh, affiliated or, or close to the group. And this, yeah. this went, I found... So, for example, this year, Joanne Anderson, who is the kind of, I think, I, I don't know too much about the, the local politics, but I think she's the Starmerite, or she definitely wasn't the Corbynite candidate to be uh, Labour, uh, Liverpool mayor. She joined this year. Claire Cobo, who was the Haringey, where we are, um, uh, leader of the council, uh, and then quit, uh, was, was, was given a fellowship, or it appears was given a fellowship in 2016, the year after Corbyn was elected, and then quit the following year, saying that Cor uh, citing 
sexism and bullying from Corbyn supporters. So it, you see this over and over again. Uh, Roshana Ali, uh, um, uh, Alison McGovern, like loads of loads of characters that, that that popped up during the Corbyn years to to basically bring him down have been affiliated in some way to the British American project. I mean, and also on the Emmerdent Code issue, you know, the Starmer um, establishment within the Labour Party were pushing a replacement for her in Labour by the name of Mette Coban. Now, Mette Coban heads an organisation funded by the US Embassy, which is My Life, My Say, which is supposedly about uh, encouraging political involvement among young people. And what really we have illustrated all of us in our own work is actually the Labour Party functions as limiting political participation within the yeah. society. It's not there to broaden involvement. It's a control measure, like it's a pressure valve. Like it's, it's an, it, it recruits people in from movements and neutralizes them yeah. more often than not. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, and really that kind of leads us on to the part of the show where we speak to you, Asa. Now, you've seen the Labour Files recently. You um, have already been working on an important book, which I believe is going to be very essential in understanding this period that we've lived through. Can you just break down for us what exactly your book is about? What's it called? What's the angle that you are adopting and how it might sort of cross over with some of what Matt has spoken about? Because really we're talking about a sort of trifecta of control within the, the political sphere in Britain, which is a combination of US intelligence, British intelligence and Israeli intelligence, often mm. acting in concert. And we'll get in, in, into the end of where sometimes they, they diverge from each other's positions in terms of what happens here. But can you just break down for us where your bit kind of fits into it? Yeah, um, the book is called Weaponizing Antisemitism. Um, and Weaponizing Antisemitism, how the Israel lobby took down Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and so it's about the, the Corbyn years in the Labour Party and the whole smear campaign that was uh, very effective in destroying the movement that brought him to the leadership of the Labour Party. Um, and... Yeah, it's 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 about those uh, four, four years, five years of his leadership, really, and it's really coming up in, into the present day. Like as we're filming this, I'm still, you know, we're, the book should be published in the early part of next year, and you know, right up to the last minutes, I'm I'm still adding new parts to the book because the story is still unfolding. You know, it's the kind of story that um, is still going on, even two years. We're coming up to three years since Jeremy Corbyn was kicked out as a Labour Party MP. There's still things happening, you know. There's still the, st the same smears are still being used, you know. This kind of um, weaponized anti-Semitism, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I, and so like, I, I mean, obviously, I've been reporting this story for seven years. So the book was kind of the culmination of all of that reporting, basically, that I've been doing mostly for the Electronic Intifada. Um, and it's, it really, I mean, I dive into my own reporting. Um, and the first chapter I get into Matt's, uh, Matt's interview with Corbyn was actually quite useful in some of the context, because it does bring in the issue of the Americans and what the Americans were doing. And my contention in the book is that, as you said, like, Corbyn was brought down by um, a kind of amalgamation of, of powers, of interests, of, of the British establishment, um, the American establishment, and Israel as well. Israel lobby groups in this country were um, instrumental in bringing him down and taking him down. And my, my thesis, if you will, although that makes it sound a bit academic and it's not, it's not an academic text in the sense of... Uh, being boring, I hope. I hope it's quite an interesting read, um, and you know, people who've read it um, do say that it's uh, is very readable in that regard. But the point is that um, it's um, it's they they all came together. My thesis is that um, the Israelis, the Israel lobby, the pro-Israel groups in this country. Um, and you can't separate those things, you know. It's not as simple as well. There's that's the Israelis, and these are 
throw Israel groups and never the twain shall meet. No, it's, it's things are much more murky than that. And I get into the details of, of all of that in the book. Um, but um, what I found in my reporting is the Israelis were really the spear tip of this. They were kind of reactionary vanguard. You know, they were, they were a counter-revolutionary uh, uh, vanguard in, for the campaign against Corbyn because it was the most successful thing. There was all, there, you know, there were so many um, smear campaigns they tried against him. I mean, we all saw them, you know. Uh, it, there, was, um, there was the stuff about him being a Czech spy, you know, completely made up. Um, there was, and the, you know, the, the, the Sun headlines, I'll never forget the, the headline of the Sun in 2017 election where they had this stupid mock-up of a, of a bin and Jeremy Corbyn's, Jeremy Corbyn in the bin and the headline was Corbyn. You know, they were saying you should bin Corbyn today on election day. Um, and their line was there that he was a Marxist extremist, a terrorist sympathizer and all this stuff. And this, this stuff, they tried everything and none of it worked because, and some of it even backfired. Like the, um, for example, when, um, during the 2017 election campaign, there was the, um, the Manchester bombing happened. I lived in Manchester at the time and I remember seeing adverts from the, the um, Conservatives saying that uh, Jeremy Corbyn is a friend of terrorists. Yeah. Right after the well, bombings in Manchester happened. Yeah, and that was the kind of stuff we saw. But that that one backfired because Corbyn came out. You know, all credit to him and his team. He came out. They made the right call, and they, you know, he came out strongly. He defended this instead of kind of rowing it back. He came out and said, you know, uh, the the you know the classic anti-war position really, which is that you know this. Obviously, the killers are responsible for their own actions. They're the culprits. But you also have to see the context of British wars and that has, you know, that has led to this situation. And that, you know, if we have less wars, things like this will happen well, less. I mean, and also as the classified has have revealed, there's serious question marks around training and around All the bombing that. saved from Libya by British. Yeah. Put on a boat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one one thing that I also wanted to point to just on the basis of what you've been saying about this Operation Kill Corbynism, mm. right? Is that during that period, the Israel lobby, or at least elements of it, because it's far larger in this country than we often acknowledge, yeah. stood up and identified their organizations. So, yeah. for example, they did, yeah. the Board of Deputies, and I found this, this is post- the killing of Corbynism, put in their trustees' report that they have a close working relationship with the Israeli embassy. That was new. And strengthened links with the Ministry of Strategic Affairs yeah. and the IDF spokesman unit. It, now, it was and it wasn't new, but yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we... It we, was new for them this. to admit it so publicly, although yeah. that wasn't, you know, in on public TV. It was in yeah. their documents, but they Precisely. were public, publicly available documents. Mm. And I looked at their latest report, actually, mm. which just... The latest trustees report just came out yeah. a few weeks ago, and, and it doesn't say that. They've turned <laughs> the language down. Um, yeah. they, they make... They, they, they do say, you know, we have... Uh, you can read between the lines and see the yeah. same thing, but they don't say the language so blatantly because, you know, you made such hay out of it. Well, so, and so this is the sort of question in your book and in your writing, mm. which are the most blatant examples of organizations working in concert with the Israeli government that were working against Israel, um, against uh, Corbyn at that time? Is there any that sticks out massively in well, the, the same one, way? That the one that sticks people? out to me... I mean, the one that sticks out to me is the Jewish labor movement because that is, and because that's the one you're not supposed to talk about because right. they, you know, they have Jewish, the word Jewish in their name. Yeah. So you're just supposed to say, oh, this is the Jewish community in the Labour Party yeah. and it's a legitimate organization, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, you know, Jeremy Corbyn played that game, um, you know, whether he saw it as a game or I'm, I'm, I'm sure he saw that as a sincere thing. But, you know, the point was that they, throughout the whole tenure of Corbyn's leadership, worked against him. Like, they worked to undermine him from within, and they were incredibly effective in doing right. so, you know. Um, and uh, it, was, it was not any kind of... It wasn't really a secret. They were quite blatant about it, but some of their activities were secretive, and we saw some of them come out. 
Um, and, and the, the thing is, and I get into the whole story of the JLM in my book, and you know, I've got a whole chapter on it, on their history, and you know, read my book, buy my book. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but I do, I do get into it all. Um, the point is that they, um, it didn't exist. It was a new. <laughs> in, they had this whole narrative about being a hundred year old organization, right? And it was like, oh, you know, Jews are being kicked out of the Labour Party after a hundred years and all this kind of hanging headlines about it. Um, but actually this organization really in 2015, when Corbyn was um, elected leader of the Labour Party and a you know, massive democratic vote of the membership, the Jewish Labour Movement didn't really exist anymore. It was, it was a shell. It was a paper organization which didn't um, have any kind of active life really in the Labour Party. It's, it, it, um, it, you know, they, they rely on an older organization called uh, Polit Zion, which is um, uh, Hebrew for Workers of Zion. And they sort of trace their lineage that way. Um, and, uh, you know, you can read in my book about the whole, the whole history of it. Essentially what happened in 2015 is the organization was revived by Israel lobbyists, by people who were incredibly close to um, the Israeli embassy, primarily Jeremy Newmark, you know, who was later disgraced um, in by the Jewish Chronicle of all people um, for, you know, alleged corruption of uh, tens of thousands of pounds against one of their own organizations that he previously led. Um, and, he, and, you know, he he has a very public record of working closely with the Israeli embassy um, against the BDS movement, against Palestine solidarity. Um, and, you know, he's never been um, backwards and coming forwards about that. Um, and, you know, it was him and the people around him, uh, people like uh, Adam Langelben um, and um, Peter Mason, who's now the leader of Ealing Council. Um, who who revived this organization? One of their first acts was to recruit um, Ella Rose out from the Israeli, the Israeli embassy. embassy. Big big fan of your work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this this is what they um, this is what they did, and you know they set about really trying to undermine Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party from within because they saw it as their Labour Party, you mm -hmm. know, and they were only one part of the Labour Party, right, who saw it as their Labour Party and that um, Corbyn and his people had to be, you know, kicked out of the Labour Party. Um, the, the most striking thing to me that they were doing, and I, I get into this story in my book, is the is at the Labour Party Conference 2016, um, which is when, if people remember The Lobby, the documentary, the Al Jazeera documentary series, The Lobby, when this Israeli embassy operative, Shai Massot, was at the Labour Party conference doing all these nefarious undercover activities, um, the, the JLM was also carrying out activities at the Labour Party conference where they had organized in concert with the Israeli embassy. The Israeli embassy, Shai, said it was his delegation, but um, Ella Rose was also saying it was her delegation. This delegation of um, Israeli politicians, young Israeli politicians from the Israeli Labour Party who came over mm -hmm. to the Labour Party conference. And I was there reporting that year. And I, you know, I went to every meeting that I could about Palestine. I even went to the um, Labour Friends of Israel reception. Um, and... Um, they um, they were there at all of them. You know, yeah. they were there at um, the World Transformed, which is supposed yeah, to be yeah. the, the pro Corbyn event. And there yeah. was the debate about Palestine and the, the so called Labour anti Semitism scandal. Yeah, and they were there in the audience, and they were, you know, they was they were trying to portray themselves as, as oh, we're young activists from Israel, and we just want peace, and you shouldn't be undermining yeah. us. You know, when you have boycotts of Israel, yeah. it's um, it's anti Semitism and all this kind of stuff. And so they were sort of a disinformation activity. Um, JLM was the JLM had organised this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and in there's a really key part of the. I'll just one more thing I want to say on that is mm. that a really key part of that that was filmed for the Al Jazeera documentary. Um, I can't remember if it was in the documentary or it was in the transcripts, but I, I'm, I'm, I referenced it in my book, which is that Ella Rose says because um, she's explaining to the undercover reporter. Um, you know, because he's saying he's confused. I can't. He's saying, I, I, or I thought Shai said the Israeli embassy organized this delegation. Yeah. And you're saying you organized it. And she's saying, well, it was his idea originally, or it was their idea originally. I can't remember which, the, but the, the Israelis' idea originally, but they can't own it. I yeah, can't remember so why. So you've got, you've got a group, the JLM, um, which is 
presenting itself as the representatives of the Jewish community and the Labour yeah. Party, acting as a cutout for a hostile foreign power. Yeah, yeah. You know, people do question that sometimes when I call Israel mm. a hostile foreign power, you know, because of course Israel's an alliance with the British government, but it's certainly hostile against the Labour Party and certainly hostile well, against Jeremy Corbyn's and, Labour Party. And, and this leads us quite neatly onto the next bit. So what we're laying out really is the anatomy of party capture, where today you have on the NEC Luke Akehurst, who yeah. is, you know, he heads We Believe in Israel, which is a BICOM project. You know, We Believe in Israel has been trying to get my music taken off Spotify, for example. It has said that it works with a range of stakeholders, including the Israeli embassy. So there's a clear acknowledgement of a relationship. In the Al Jazeera lobby, uh, first investigation, Shai Massoud actually mentions Luke Akehurst in glowing terms. Yeah. You also have the Asaf Kaplan connection, which is a story that you broke. This is someone from Unit 8200, the Israeli Military Intel Intelligence Signals Communication Unit, mm. which actually blackmails Palestinians with the information it procures through surveilling their communication. Now in a key position within the Labour internal um, party. But then the wider question is that of state capture. And the kind of dynamic that plays out in terms of that issue of state capture. So I've been looking into recently something called the UK Israel Tech Hub. Now, this organization is staffed by former Israeli military and former Israeli intelligence and headed by Haim Shani, who was formerly the uh, Director General of Israel's Finance Ministry. Now, this organization is based in the British Embassy in Israel, okay? It works out of it. Its stated purpose is to um, expand the Israeli tech industry in England and to target contracts in England. So they work closely with British Telecom. They also have been instrumental in the signing of a memorandum of understanding between Israel and the Northern Health Service um, in England and are on target to be a vehicle through which many NHS contracts are procured by Israeli tech companies. This is funded by the British Foreign Office. It's funded by the British Department for Trade. It's funded by the British uh, Department for Media and Culture and also funded by the British Embassy. So what you have here is the British taxpayer footing the bill for an operation which is about the expansion of Israeli economic and also even, and this is a slightly more tenuous point, surveillance interests within this country. Mm, and I'll explain mm, what I mean yeah. by that. So in 2012, there's an article in Calculus Tech which um, claims that it's passed through the Israeli military censor, mm. which several years after the fact claimed that a policy was passed in 2012 by Netanyahu's government to put uh, people from Unit 8200 into private companies in order to fulfill the purposes of Israeli external intelligence. And it's out of that that you get NSO Group. It's out of that that you get Black Cube. It's out of that that you get <clears throat> all manner of tech organizations across the world, including one Team 8, right, which was set up by Eric Schmidt, right? This is the head of Google. In 2015, at the same time as he was working at Google, with the former head of Unit 8200 mm. in Israeli military intelligence. So these tech companies, a proliferation of Israeli tech companies, the idea of the startup nation being uh, pushed everywhere and then being seen as the go-to place where you get your tech needs delivered and how Britain is one small part of that picture in terms of footing that bill. Yeah. So what we're looking at is a political system whereby you cannot actually meaningfully vote against the interests of the United States, specifically when it comes to foreign policy. You know, there was a, a, an Oxford University uh, research paper that found there were over 105 US bases or, or US soldiers based on British bases throughout this country. We know it was covered in Declassified UK um, several months ago, I think it was around February or March, that the US were about to spend three billion on expanding their military and intelligence operations in Britain. The idea of sovereignty for this country is a complete joke. Yeah. Doesn't mm. exist. You can't vote against these particular permanent interests. Yeah. Now, one 
interesting thing that a system like that will always produce is movements that are no longer um, satisfied to use the same tactics that look at the political system and say, okay, we haven't been able to have our interests reflected within that political system. So therefore, we are going to do things which break that status quo and break that norm and establish a new dynamic. And that movement has undoubtedly been Palestine action. Yeah. We can say that Palestinians within Gaza have painted on the wall the name of Palestine action, have publicly thanked Palestine action. I've been to camps in Lebanon where people know the name of Palestine action. Sabra and Shatila, where people speak the name of Palestine action. What Palestine action has achieved, has achieved is to pierce through that norm, status quo, established violence, to refuse to comply, to break that inflexible, unflexible political system. And so that leads on to the next person that we are going to speak to today, Huda Amori, who has been an integral part of this insurgency against Israel's military interests within this country. We are not just talking about the cancelling of contracts. We are talking about a subsidiary for anti-technologies in Oldham that in tandem with the local community who had been active for several years to let people in the area know in that factory they are making weapons that kill people that you consider yourself to have an affinity with. And so off the back of that, Ferranti Technologies was sold by Elbit Systems, Israel's largest arms company, at a significant loss. And that was thanks to Palestine Action and thanks to people in the local community. What you also have is the closing down of Elbit Systems' London office, thanks to Palestine Action's activity. There have been hundreds of people arrested across this struggle. There have been so many actions taken. And actually the lesson that comes from this is that within our political system, we have a very narrow space where we can have our ideas met. And so it's really my honor to introduce Huda today to talk to us about what has recently developed in the struggle against Israel's military interests in this country. Thank you for joining us, Huda. Thank you, um, and thank you for that introduction. And I think it is um, very important um, in doing this work to recognize what has come before and, and the work done by others to expose um, the political situation that we have and the political situation that, as you said, created, uh, created Palestine action. It was out of uh, a lack of democratic process. You know, there is no democratic process in this country when it comes towards ending British complicity with the colonization of Palestine. And I think when you realize that, then it becomes a very easy decision and a very easy choice to start a direct action movement, which actually just goes straight to those factories, to those offices and use our own body and often sledgehammers and other tools to smash and stop these places from operating time and time again, um, despite facing arrest. And actually that is, it, it's part of, um, when we started Palestine Action, we hoped it, we would get, get, get the successes, but it was started more because it had to start, it had to happen. Um, I couldn't sit by and know that this factory was operating in the same country as us and were getting away with it and no one else was going to stop it except for ordinary people. And I think through that, there's been uh, a number of people, very high numbers of people who have seen that, been inspired to do the same. Um, and I think that despite what happens with the political establishment, um, when you're doing the kind of grassroots activism, it's very easy to have hope um, when you see people rising up and taking this type of action. And also, um, in addition to taking the action and effectively closing these places down time and time again, um, we're also seeing um, court cases be won in, in the Crown Court um, as well. Which or dropped altogether to, because they can't be bothered. Or dropped altogether, yeah. Because they know yeah. they're going to lose. And, yeah. and essentially, this is a message to those that would have us in jail. Let me yeah. be absolutely clear. If you think that 250 people 
is the only amount of people in this country who are willing to go to prison for Palestine, then you are deeply mistaken. Let's be clear. There's hundreds of thousands of people in this country who feel deeply passionate about asserting the sanctity of Palestinian humanhood, who are part of that struggle. When Israel was bombing Gaza in 2021, May, part of the key reason that held it back, yes, it was due partly to a strike inside 48 Palestine, you saw 65,000 construction workers down tools for one day, and that cost the Israeli economy at least $40 million. In addition to that, you saw a thousand bus workers go on strike, which led to the cancellation of 300 trips. Also, you saw people pulled out of the IDF reserves, so already working within the Israeli economy, to go and join this exertion of military force. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you had the resistance able to disable the function of the airport, right? This is the way that you achieve economic paralysis. Yeah. But on top of that, what did you see? You saw Palestine Action shut down the Leicester factory for six consecutive work days, meaning that when you are weighing up what is in your interest, you are held back. All of us are of generations that saw Operation Castle. All of us are from generations that saw 2014, mm -hmm. where about 2,400 people were killed, including the massacre at Shajaiya, right? In terms of exertion of violence in, in, in a spectacular way, we are not living through peak Israel. And one of the reasons we are not living through peak Israel is because of the work of Electronic Intifada and because of the work of Palestine Action. So, Huda, if you can tell us firstly mm. about the recent information that has come to light about Elbit's epic failure in this country. Yeah, yeah, um, I like that description of it. But uh, basically, within the last month, um, there have been many questions put to the Alex Chalk, who is uh, the Defence Procurement Minister, only been in since October 2022. And they were all asked by Labour MPs, um, all of whom have an affinity to Labour Friends of Israel. And they were asking about Albert Systems contracts. Um, they actually asked about four different contracts, two of which are the uh, submarine training contract that they got to work on the nuclear submarines in Britain and the other one was to work on the Royal Navy. Um, and the submarine one was actually confirmed by Alex Chalk to be uh, canceled and Elbit's been removed from it, despite it being a team of companies that gained that contract. Elbit was singled out and taken off that um, this month. And their, their presence in the uh, Royal Navy contract is now, they're basically now negotiating their departure. Um, using Alex Chalk's words. But interestingly as well, they also mentioned these other two contracts, one of which is under review um, and the other one, it was a vague response. So, we, so we're keeping a close eye um, on, those, on those developments. But just to explain about the, the submarine contract um, that they had, uh, they gained this in May this year, and it was actually their biggest contract that they've gained in the past few years from the British state. Um, and six days after they gained this contract, there was an action at the headquarters of Elbit, uh, which we now know is a, it's got a special status because they hold government classified information. Um, and these activists had broken inside the building on the Nakba day, um, commemorating uh, when uh, the Zionist militia d d forced out more than half of the Palestinian population. And they broke inside, barricaded themselves inside, caused severe damage to the facility. And obviously it was a massive uh, breach of security. Um, later on, they were arrested and some were held uh, in prison, but eventually they all got um, were, were released. And what we've seen throughout Palestine Action is a number of actions which involve people um, from blockading the gates to people breaking inside to destroy the weapons that they hold inside. And not only are they materially destroying um, these weapons so they cannot be used, but also they are, um, by, by, by consequence of doing that, uh, breaching security. And because Elbit, basically because they've managed to develop these weapons by targeting and oppressing the Palestinian people to create the apartheid state, um, they've been able to gain these contracts with the MOD. And this is a big part 
of why they are here in this country is to take advantage of, you know, the British uh, defence market. Um, so once we see that start to reverse, then, you know, then it's, it starts to um, hopefully fall like dominoes. And this does come after, like you said before, already two of their factories closing. And a lot of their PR and their focus in these past two years has been around the Navy, has been around these submarines, etc. So they've obviously tried to move into a certain direction. And basically that past two years work is now um, gone. Yeah. And also I think what's important to point to is the use of the phrase for reasons of operational sovereignty. Yeah. So this is what the uh, reason, part of the reason for the moving of Elbit off of the nuclear submarine deal was operational mm. sovereignty. So what does that mean? That means there is, it would seem to me, a fear of giving Elbit that level of access to British nuclear secrets. So what we have here is the limitations of this state capture actually showing itself. And you have the perfect storm whereby you have the PR of Elbit irrevocably damaged by Palestine action in the mud. Hundreds of thousands of people across this country now have an alternative direction to aim their passions and their energy the next time they see people they consider their brothers and sisters being killed in Palestine, rather than the Israeli embassy, which is probably one of the most secure buildings in the entire country. Yeah. It also shows that... Um, you know that use of that phrase is really interesting that you've pointed out to that it, it, you're right it does show the limits of uh, israeli state capture but it also shows that it is a reasonable suspicion like i mean i i've written about this before you know people i mean i i think some people on the left very dogmatically say that you know israel oh you know it, that um israel is kind of uh, a puppet of the the US that it's the US and it's not the tail wagging the dog etc yep. etc yep. and I think that's largely true to an extent but I don't think I, mean, I think that's largely a, a, a pathological thing about the people who say that actually, yeah often. because I I think it's more um, that uh, Israel is an attack dog which sometimes attacks its owner right it has it has a certain degree of agency I mean we look we we only have to see Jonathan Pollard precisely the you know the the um, Israeli spy. Or, 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 or literally 2019 devices found outside the White House, which were believed to have been put there yeah. by US intelligence, the, by the Israelis to monitor phone the, calls the, in the White the House. The US defense intelli intelligence, the US counterintelligence establishment puts Israel in its top 10 yeah. list of threats. Top Up three. there with North top Korea, three. Top China three. and Venezuela. Top, top three in, in states that surveil the United States. Nine State Department officials were found to have Pegasus software hacking their phone. In so, Andrew and Leslie Coburn's book, they say that um, Israel stole its nuclear weapons technology from the US in the first place. Now, Seymour Hirsch disagrees with that, but you know, there's, um, there's a long precedent for this kind of stuff. There's a long absolutely. history of this. Absolutely. And so Huda, just our last question mm. quickly. Tell us about this recent Crown Court victory and what that then effectively means for future Palestine action operations. Yeah, so we have um, in total probably over 20, 25 Crown Court cases that are due to go ahead, um, all of which have been delayed at least once. Uh, this is something routine that we see in Palestine action, but the first one went ahead just a few weeks ago. And this was an action at the start of Palestine action where they had drenched the uh, former uh, London headquarters of Albert Systems. And, um, you know, there was a lot of paint running down the road, etc. And they were charged with a conspiracy to commit criminal damage. It's a common charge that we see in a lot of cases. And uh, they went to court. And the difference between a magistrate's court and a crown court is that you have a jury, you're trialed by people from the community. It's not a single judge or three judges who decide if you're guilty or not guilty. So it really was a test to see um, how, how, that would, how that would go. And um, what we saw was the jury um, unanimously, within an hour of going out for a verdict, had returned a not guilty verdict. Amazing to see people who were there said that there were jurors in tears, blowing kisses to the defendant, saying thank you, wow. Madam, thank you to them. Wow. But also what happened during the trial was interesting because Elbit have been sending note takers 
um, note takers, which apparently cost £200 an hour, um, to sit in all of the Palestine action cases. And at the start of this case, the Crown Prosecution Service and the defence had agreed that on, on facts that they both agreed on, which are just facts, which are relevant to the case, that Elbit is indeed an arms company, that it is an Israeli <laughs> arms company that, that make combat drones. <laughs> apparently, the, the, that was you know, about as far as you can get in the courts these days. And then apparently Elbit, this woman had gone back to Elbit and Elbit were not happy yeah. about that, about the fact that they were just described as literally what they are on their own website said a lot worse <laughs> about that. And then the, the prosecutor just started saying, we don't agree with this. We don't agree with what you're saying when everyone, when, whenever a defendant would say, this is an arms company making these drones, because just to let you know, the Crown does not accept that. It was a well, it's just this making just facts, it's making a know? mockery of itself, and, yeah. and that is what yeah. Palestine Action has done so wonderfully: is it's looked at this hypocritical lie of a political system, and it's teased out those contradictions yeah. and sharpened them as much as possible. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I wanted to say thank you to all of you. I hope to get you back on the Watchdog here with our new setup for Mint Press. I would encourage everybody to support the Palestine Action campaign, to um, donate to the legal fees. This is a new push when considering that you have over 250 people that have been arrested across these years of activity. They need support. And so I hope that people can give their support there. Also, I encourage everyone to read and support Electronic Intifada. Fantastic vital journalism which has broken so many stories which we desperately needed throughout those years you know without electronic intifada there's so much about the anatomy of the the coup and the killing of corbynism that we wouldn't know and besides that there's so much that we wouldn't know about what israel does it's the only place that was willing to publish a story i had about um a particular uh, cyber tech company tech company doing cyber security for in fact uh, the washington post and cnn mm. which has several uh figures from former unit 200 figures and also of course has uh, bought has several subsidiaries that were set up by people from Unit 200. Electronic Intervider was the only place that would publish that. Not that I asked the classified UK, but it's sort of outside of their remit. But in terms of particularly when we're talking about Matt and his work on the Julian Assange case, you know, it has been absolutely fantastic. And it has also revealed the way in which the judiciary of this country is captured in so many ways. So please do support Declassified UK. Also become a member and a subscriber. We have a lot to do and the world is ours to win. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Watchdog.